Haribo. So, um, some people might think that's a bit of a strange topic in the middle of yoga, meditation and mantras. And it's like, what does this have to do with spiritual life? What does it have to do with the pursuit of enlightenment? And the answer is everything. The enlightenment of the living being is experienced in three principal phases. The coming to know my true spiritual identity, that I, I am a spiritual being having a temporary material experience. This body that I'm hauling around is not me. It does not. It, uh, it doesn't tell me who I am. In fact, overly identifying with it, with the body that I'm hauling around, is the path to unhappiness. How about that? So much for the selfies. That ain't you. It's got nothing to do with you, not really. It's just a vehicle that you're experiencing the world through. The second broad level of, of spiritual realization or enlightenment is coming to experience the reality of where I fit. Where do I fit in relation to this world in a very broad sense? Where do I fit in relation to other living beings? Is there any being higher than me? <coughs> Is there any connection here? And this was the aspiration of most of the great um, Ashtanga yogis. They sought what was called Paramatma realization. The awakening of my true and eternal spiritual function is the greatest of all spiritual experiences. In that experience, one will be immersed literally in an ocean of love. Love has nothing to do with this world. I sound like Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it? <laughs> I mean, okay, that was a song, you know, somebody She's talking about the normal experience in this world. Here I am seeking that love, seeking that connection, that relationship. And everywhere I go, my heart is crushed. Everywhere I go, I experience disappointment. Sooner or later, somehow or other. And even if you have the most wonderful relationship that lasts throughout the life of the body, sooner or later, one of you is going to go. One of you is going to leave. And my God, how devastating is that? <laughs> that's like, that's the ultimate heartbreak. So the experience that we have of what we like to call love in this world, we must understand is, is limited. And it is not a full and complete spiritual experience. It doesn't last. There are limitations to it. It cannot completely fulfill us. This is like, 
I mean, so many relationships end on the trash heap, the garbage heap, the rubbish heap, because of placing this expectation and this burden on another person that you should be what my heart is looking for, that you should be able to fulfill this deep need I have for love. If I think that that is even a possibility, I, I don't have to know anything about you. I don't know, need to know anything about who you're involved with. I know, though, it will end in unhappiness. It will end in profound unhappiness, especially if you're the one that's still very attached to the person and I've grown tired of you. That's just like, oh my God. You know, we have these expectations that are unrealistic. And to develop a true spiritual perspective is really going to help people with their experience in life. It opens the door, not to the possibility, but the reality of being able to experience real happiness even while living within this world, within this body. So, um, what is this love thing that we're looking for? Well, it really depends on, on how you, what you're doing with it. Everybody's got these kind of filters. And so at different ages and different experiences in life, you kind of, you know, search for love or expect to find love through these different kind of filters. But there are, there are some characteristics. You know, it's so hard to define. You ask people, what, what are you looking for? What is it really? What is it that you're hoping to experience? One of the unfortunate things is to describe this physiological and psychological reaction that we have when we meet someone whom we find attractive. And it just immediately, oh, is this going to be the one? And then I get sort of like, you know, this excitement. And it uh, doesn't matter how old you are, but I mean, you see it even with young people. I mean, in early teenage life, or what do they call it? Puppy love. It's kind of cute. Pa, and they call it puppy love. <laughs> there was a song like that. You know, where people sort of like, you know, are, are just trying to struggle through their, this body, this particular in this lifetime is a whole new experience and it's growing and I've encountered someone. I don't even know that I'm looking for someone. Not really. And then I kind of like, suddenly everything starts changing and I start looking for that person. And when I come near someone that I'm attracted to, I feel my heart, there's a physiological response. The heart beats a little faster, might get all sweaty in the palms and <coughs> not be able to talk so well <laughs> and get all kind of nervous and, you know, or start wandering, run off to the bathroom, splash some water, look in the mirror, you know. <laughs> Come on, you can do it. You can <laughs> All of these funny things that people do in different ways, you know, in the anticipation. But I'll, I'll tell you, what you're feeling at that time is not love. It's just a physiological and psychological response. And there is this hope, there is this hope that somehow I'm going to be finding this love that I'm expecting. And then we bring all this kind of, we bring all this expectation to the, to the meeting <laughs> of what I expect from the other person, what I'm hoping for, what I'm aspiring for. And 
Inevitably, I will be disappointed, either very slowly, there's just like this gradual dimming of the lights over a period of months or years, and it just like, you know, all that initial excitement, that only took a couple of months at the most, maybe a couple of weeks, maybe six months if you're so-called lucky, and then that, all that excitement's gone, now you're dealing with more than the package. I mean, we have this like ridiculous idea that if the package is wonderful, if it's attractive and beautiful and smells good, the contents must be amazing. <laughs> the idea that you could get a box that's beautifully gift wrapped with wonderful ribbons on it and it smells so good on the outside and you could open it up and there's a dog turd in there doesn't even dawn on us. Doesn't matter what the package looks like, it's the content. And I'm telling you, the content cannot fulfill your actual spiritual need for love. And then we start sort of like connecting love to a sexual experience or all kinds of just like, you know, demands that we put on others somehow or other, all these things. But really, these things don't really define love. In, in this world, you know, I, I, if you see any, anybody that's had children, I, I had the fortune of delivering my first child and participating in the two other births. And to, to witness a birth is like, wow. It's like things you should witness in your life. You should witness birth and you should witness death. To be with someone going through either of these experiences or both of these experiences is going to add so much to your life. It's like a, it's a major dose of reality. So... You know, when a parent, and particularly a mother, holds a child in their arms, you know, and they've fed them or whatever, and there is just this utter look on the baby's face of contentment, of protection, like not a care in the world. It's just like, oh. <laughs> in complete ecstasy and the parent looks at the child and has this wonderful feeling this wonderful feeling is the threshold it is the threshold it is like an introduction to love in that condition there is no expectation you don't want the kid to do anything just be what you are, and it's driving me crazy. I love this. <laughs> and that's pretty unique, because most of the relationships that we have, we have such high demand. We have such high demand. As a child grows up a little bit, a little toddler, a little toddler who puts its arms around a parent's neck, kisses it and says, I love you, mommy, or I love you, daddy. You know, that just sends flutters through the heart. It's like a wonderful experience. You're not really expecting very much. It is just this intimacy and this very nice connection where you're not laboring to get something out of it. It is quite natural and it's probably the closest thing to what is actual spiritual love. The experience of spiritual love is the greatest of all transcendental realizations and experiences. Within the heart of each living being sits the actual Lord of our heart. The most wonderful experience is to intimately connect with that transcendent Lord. This experience in, in Sanskrit was called Prema. 
And in that condition, one now discovers what love really is. See, you have, you have a seed within your heart of hearts. There is a seed of love sitting there. It is part of who you are. Living in the material world and through the experiences of this body and taking this to be the whole deal and everything, the ultimate reality, it messes us up. It messes us up and completely covers what is truly part of our eternal spiritual nature. But it is there. And this process, this process of, of mantra, meditation is a process of uncovering, clearing away the debris and dust that has covered up this natural condition. So it begins to be able to shine forth. In reality, the chanting of mantras, the engagement in the spiritual exercise of, of yoga, as a spiritual practice. It's not about becoming powerful and really together and just looking so cool. And No, it's got nothing to do with that. That's going in the wrong direction. It is actually a journey. It is like water. Where does water go if it flows naturally? It flows to the lowest point, does it not? Naturally. It seeks out the lowest point. Part of the spiritual experience of full self-realization is this growing humility and this capacity to let go and, and get rid of all the things that I'm built up to so-called protect myself to take this very low and humble position within the heart and to, take, to seek shelter in the Lord of my actual heart. This is called Lord Paramatma or Bhagavan. When a yogi understands this, then their chanting of mantra is actually a love song. It is a song of the heart, the heart of hearts, where one is actually crying out for the fulfillment of this eternal need I have for the most wonderful and amazing experience of love. And from that experience will come the highest form of spiritual happiness called Ananda, and in this case, Prem Ananda. So what has been offered here, hey, it's not just a little community center here in Grey Lynn where some people are showing up, chant a few mantras, cool, and just relax. Yeah, that's, that's there if you want it. But if you would also like to progress in your spiritual journey to seek true enlightenment and the fruit of enlightenment, divine love, then you come to the right place. Okay? Looking, looking in this world and in other material personalities and relationships. It's fine. You can do that. Don't worry. I'm not telling people to get all snotty or cruel or harsh with each other. No. But do understand. Do understand. There is not one person in this world that can fulfill your need for love. Don't expect that. Be kind to others, be loving with others, but do not expect them to completely fulfill you. Sorry, that person's not hanging out here. Well, he is actually, but he's hiding in this very wonderful place within the lotus-like heart. When the heart has become gentle and soft, due to the practice of yoga, 
then it has become like a blooming lotus. And when one enters into this wonderful place, now one can come to experience this profoundly wonderful spiritual experience. Okay? Did you get your money's worth? <laughs> this stuff is really cool. I tell you, the whole spiritual path and real essence of yoga is totally amazing. It is so wonderful. And it's what we are all looking for. We've just got to kind of like grow a brain. Can I say that? Or I'm not allowed to say that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm talking to myself too. You know, we've got to get it together. We need to learn. And this was the importance in the spiritual journey of being able to seek guidance and direction from those who walk the path, those who have succeeded on the path, because they can adequately direct us. So the things that we are passing on, these are ancient spiritual truths. Not only are they truths, but they contain a unique potency. These mantras that we are giving you are not just sounds that you go and pick up from, you know, the yoga journal or somewhere. Sorry, something you just open a book and grab it, you know, and think, okay, now I got a mantra. No, there is a whole system for how one receives mantra. And when one receives it appropriately and chants it with humility and an openness of heart, then one is able to let into your heart this spiritual potency that comes with mantra. Okay? All good? Thank you very much. Is that Thank you.